Transcribed, starring Carlton Young. Yes, I am Phil Galt, known to the underworld as the Whisperer. It all began ten years ago when I was kicked in the throat while playing college football. After the bandages were removed, I opened my mouth to speak. But all that came out was this rattling hiss. After a baker's dozen, the women fainted. When I spoke to them and countless babies went into paroxysms of crying, I disappeared from my usual haunts and went to work for a group which I later discovered were known as the Crime Syndicate. I decided to stay with them and collect sufficient evidence to help destroy them. Then one day I met Dr. Lee, and through a miracle of surgery, he restored my voice, enabling me to resume my real identity as Philip Galt, lawyer. This dual identity makes life very interesting. For if the syndicate ever finds out that the whisperer who passes on their orders is really Philip Galt, the man who has wrecked so many of their plans, there'll be slow walking and low moaning, but I won't be around to comment on it. In this fight against the syndicate, I need the help of all honest people. People like yourself and Ellen Norris, Dr. Lee's nurse. When I was told to help kill Joe Ainsley, it hit me like a low left. Joe and I had munched from the same ice cream bar, earned varsity letters together, and sported summa cum laude's on our sheepskins. We had whispered together in the sacred halls of the lawyers' club and argued at the same bar, cocktail, as well as justice. I dialed his office, then his home, but even spotting the telephone company two extra rings, he still didn't answer. I couldn't go hunting him until after Pollock's call to get his instructions. I fretted and fumed, but finally, at three minutes past eleven, the phone jangled into life. Pollock was on time, so I answered in the voice of the whisperer. Central City. Pollock checking in. Pollock, you will find Joe Ainsley, the lawyer. Joe Ainsley, lawyer. When you locate him, kill him. Check. I am to assist you, so tell me where you are staying. I was hired to come and do a rub-out. Nothing was said about any assistant. I got my instructions. If you want me, try and find me. Wait. My only advantage over Pollock is I know where Joe Ainsley lives. I threw my convertible out of the garage, pick up Ellen Norris at Dr. Lee's office, and ten minutes later we're at Ainsley's country estate. He isn't home. We try his office, then the lawyer's club, then two of his favorite soft drink emporiums. But Joe Ainsley is among the missing. But if I can't find him, neither can Pollock. I almost give it up. Ellen is wearing one of those fall dresses, which reminds you of Indian summer, with the leaves turning brown and the smell of clean woods and hazy smoke in the air. The kind mother was too bashful to wear. The afternoon is made for a long ride in the country. I bolster my sagging resolve, and with a mental note that this is the last try for the day, we work our way through the dinner Sailor Joe's, push aside the curtains of smoke, and rest our elbows on his sticky bar. His drinks are atrocious, but his information is grade A. Welcome to Sailor Joe. Oh, hi, Mr. Gold. I haven't seen you since that warehouse came. I've been busy learning new power tricks, Joe. Oh, well, this is Miss Norris. Oh, hi, Miss Norris. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I bet you said it all the introductions, huh? This is parlor truck business, though. Well, let him show you. All right. Hand me an empty bottle. Mate, I don't sell enough drinks to empty one bottle a month. It only works with an empty bottle. Well, I'm a reasonable man. 
I have here a bottle of very rare vintage. Very cheap vintage. Yeah, distilled by great vintners. In a bath. During the year 1865. 1951. Containing about five drinks. Three drinks. Worth about $10. Maybe 90 cents. Sold. It's clean and fluid anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Phil. Someone here is a candidate for a fruitcake. Well, it could be me. Watch this. Bar needs mop, and so I'll just empty it on top. Watch your elbow, miss. Well, if I do that, I'll miss the trick. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rude. <laughs> All right, here's the bottle. Thanks. Now, uh, I take this 20. Whoa. Whoa, mate. Last time it was a 50. But this is an easy one, Joe. Uh, so I roll the 20 and push it into the neck of the bottle. So. What's so special about that? Because no one but me can pull the 20 out. Oh. Yeah. Now. If you can tell me within an hour where I can find a lawyer by the name of Joe Ainsley, that 20 will come unglued and find its way into your moth-proof hip pocket. Go. You're regular. I like you, mate. In a blow, you'd sell with your scuppers ten feet under. You're right and stay seaworthy. You'd do the tie to. All right. I'll put a ten with the 20. Make it a hundred, and it's a deal. A hundred? That's robbery. Give me back the 20. No, no. Hold it, mate. Hold it. Don't sell with your cargo hatch on back. Now, you're the skipper, but you want a course. Make it a C-note, and after you sail the fix I set, you come back. If it wasn't worth the hundred, I'll refund the amount you asked. You sound serious. As a rip tied to a rowboat. It's that or nothing. How much money do you have, Alan? The change out of the 20. Loan it to me? Oh, there goes my only hope of a hamburger. Here. Joe, that makes me still $15 short. Can do? Mm, well... If you uh... trust us, we'll bring you the hundred dollars later. <laughs> Seagull and the mints worth doing the bill. Should we go bad with? Lady, I'd rather have eighty five dollars now. Because if you mess around the address I'm gonna give you, you won't be able to come back. <laughs> On this cheerful note, an eighty five dollars poor, you drove down to the dingy neighborhood of one thirty two Adolphus Street, our destination, Office three twenty four trap building. It looks like a reject from Dally's Nightmare. Even the sunlight has cobwebs on it by the time it filters through the purple canyon of the street. A creaky, French-type birdcage elevator wheezes upward, and every second we expect to be traveled by a batch of bats. The door to 324 is out of character. It's solid oak, and is out of place as a garden gate on Fort Knox. It is an arrogant door, the kind that pushes back at your knuckles when you knock. What do you expect to find here? If Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff don't fall over each other to let us in, I'll be bitterly disappointed. What in the world would Joe Ainsley be doing in a place like this? Nothing, if he had any say in the matter. You think Pilot got him and brought him here? My only thought now is whether or not I can pick this lock. Phil, so, I didn't know you were an accomplished burglar. Well, no, just another facet of my... Oh, it doesn't squeak. Phil, so it ought to squeak. Maybe not. Come in. Phil, so, this office is immaculate. Yeah, I noticed that. Now, look at the furniture. That desk is better than mine, and mine costs six hundred dollars. Why would anyone put such a beautiful setup in such a rowdy district? I don't know, but after paying eighty-five dollars for the location, I intend to find out. Well, let's see. Um, Alan, come here. Take a look. Hmm? Oh no! Oh yes. Let's try another drawer. Look at this. And this. I am looking. I'm also wondering. Why did Sailor Joe send us to the headquarters of a party cell when all I wanted to find was Joe Ainsley? I don't know, but let's keep looking. Maybe we can find a list of party members and give it to the FBI. Oh, they're too smart for that, Ellen. There's nothing here but propaganda leaflets and party line editorials. Come on, let's get out of here. Hold on, Ainsley. Come on. I whirl and find an out-of-proportion pistol staring me between the eyes. The grip and cylinder are standard, but the black hole in the end of the muzzle is at least three inches in diameter and is getting larger as the guy behind it begins to squeeze the grip. He's called me Ainsley, so it must be Pollock. And I can see he's going to shoot the wrong man before I can open my mouth for an explanation. It's all yours, Ainsley. <laughs> Ellen's scream diverts his aim, but a second is bound to be a bullseye. I yell his name, Pollock! Huh? How did you know my name? Because I'm not Ainsley. My name is Phil Goff. I'm a lawyer. Only one guy in this town knows my name, and you ain't him. I'm not interested in that. Take a look at my driver's license before you make a memory out of me. Okay, he's out the billfold. And by ease, I mean so slow that molasses it seemed like lightning. That's it. Now put it on the table. All right, now step back. Now just take a look, see. Ah. 
So I was wrong. I apologize. Oh, now you apologize. Accepted. Now, if you've no objections, we were just about to leave. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. So you go, but you're not taking a powder on me. Sooner or later, Ainsley will show, and I want you with me when that happens. Oh, you must be wrong, Mr. Pollock. Joe Ainsley will never come here. Fifty bucks I spent says he will. You made a better bargain with Sailor Joe than I did. It cost me eighty-five dollars. We've both been took. Ainsley won't show. Maybe not. Maybe that's him coming up in that squirrel cage. Now open that door behind you. Move. A pleasure. What's in there? A padded cell. You want to eat six inches of gun barrel? Oh, he isn't joking. It is a padded cell. Then get in it. I'll follow you. All right, I'll get over there in that corner. I want to be by the door. I'll just leave a crack so I can see in here and I'll be quiet. Either he does it or he gets it. I don't care which. I'll give him a ring in one last warning. That's Joe Ainsley. And getting out of line for the next few months, and if he tries to pass them, we'll have to take strong measures. Well, I got it straight from one of our boys down at Union Station. If he's already made the reservation. Not the dials. Shut up. The only man in the party who can bring this off. Seven. Nine. Two. Four. One. Five. Remember that. Won't do you any good. Hello? This is straight from the shoulder. If you've made certain reservations, cancel them. Nothing has been changed since the last time we talked. Neither the reward or the consequences. There is no argument. You will do as you were told. Ellen and I are huddled in the corner of the padded room. Pollock is at the door. As Joe Ainsley finishes, Pollock eases into the outer room. You really told him, Ainsley. What? Who are you? The last man you'll ever see on earth. Pollock had forgotten us. As he starts to pull the trigger, I leap on his back. <laughs> Joe, grab his gun! Grab his gun! Yeah. Pollock's shot goes wild. Uh, Joe Ainsley opens the drawer as Pollock swings his gun for another shot. I hack his wrist and... Hey, his gun drops to the floor. Die, right, Joe, he's an arm. Thanks, Phil. Turn him loose. It's a pleasure. What are you doing here? Well, I heard the syndicate had called your number and I wanted to warn you. I looked everywhere and finally got a tip that you show up here. I don't pretend to understand what you're doing here, Joe, but we can go into that later. After I call Lieutenant Dembers and turn this fellow over to him. That won't be necessary, Phil. I don't understand you. Maybe this will help. <laughs> you must be in this party thing pretty deep, Joe. If you can commit murder. I'm in so deep that another year or two wouldn't upset me. I see. I'll have to ask you and Ellen to get back into the room for the time being. Later today, we'll decide what to do with you. You mean how to do it, don't you? Yes, I, I guess that's what I really meant. Come on, Ellen. When we're gone, you can yell all you want. It's soundproof. Joe, you're ten degrees lower than any gutter I ever saw. I haven't time to argue with you, Phil. Joe, I'm even a nightmare. It's pretty hard to believe. I had to stake my life that I knew Joe Ainsley as well as any man alive. If somewhere unknown to me, there was a weakness, a basic flaw of character, reasoning, call it whatever you will. They found it, worked on it, and the guy who was as American as cold beef steak and apple pie is twisted and sent off balance. God help him, I feel sorry for him. Oh, my sympathy, what's closer to home? How are we going to get out of here? Any matches? Always. No lighter ever needed, that's good. Here. Light one. Don't you can take this lock? Probably, but it may take time. Oh, no. What's wrong? It's a one-way lock. The entire door is faced with steel. There's no opening of any kind on this side. We explore every nook and cranny, but the man who built that room knew all the angles and invented a few of his own. I throw my weight against the door. <laughs> Nothing. They've taken one room of the suite, lined it with steel sheathing, added over the sheathing to make it soundproof and left no openings of any kind. After an hour, the air was becoming used. Oh, I'm about to suffocate. Must be 120 in here. Oh, relax, darling. Uh, do, do as I've done. I've been counting swimming pools jumping over each other for the past ten minutes. I could do with a dip. Also, a drink of water. Now, if we get out of this, I'll never wear rubbers or a raincoat or carry an umbrella. I'll, I'll stride through the rain and let it beat down. Bang! Oh. Ellen, give me those matches. That match? Give it to me. All right. Now what? Look up at the ceiling. I'm afraid to. I'm looking. Is there a little nozzle there with a piece of copper over its nose? Several. Why? Those are automatic sprinklers. Hold a match against them and they start spraying water. I don't know whether they ring an alarm bell or not. Here's my lighter. Hold me up and we'll find out. If I'm wrong and no one hears an alarm, we'll get mighty wet in here. But I think I'd rather drown than suffocate. 
I tear some of the padding from the wall. It's cotton. I hold my bonfire under the various nozzles and... There's one. Two more ought to do it. Oh, it does enough. If it isn't, three won't help. Come over here. There's less spray. Oh, Phil, I'm, I'm cold. You won't be long either way. So, I'm standing on Uncle Dean. Keep praying, Ellen. Within. Only about five minutes. Oh, hurry. Please, hurry. Bill, they're here. They're here. They're coming at the door. It's not one sided. I'll pound right back at them. Maybe the fireman or maybe Joe Ainsley. Right now, I'd be happy to see any of them. Oh, they're breaking down the door. That means the fireman came first. You know, Elvis, contrary to all safety rules, when I have a child, the first thing I'll teach him will be how to play with matches. An hour later, minus the goosebumps, but with a tendency to web feet, I'm warm and dry in my apartment. A half hour after that, Ellen drives up. The syndicate wants one Joe Ainsley party liner killed. Why? I didn't know. All I knew for certain is that I have to call the syndicate and report that Pollock is dead and Ainsley's still alive. I dial the operator and give her the New York number of the syndicate. When the call comes through, I answer as the voice of the whisperer. Central City. Go ahead, Central City. Pollock mailed. Was killed by Ainsley. Ainsley must not live through the night. There is no time to send in an out-of-town killer. You will kill him yourself. I am not a hatchet man. If Ainsley is not dead by morning, you will be. What's wrong? You're paler than a ghost. I've been ordered to kill Joe Ainsley. Oh, Phil. Why don't you tell the police he murdered Pollock and let them take care of it? The explanation would expose my association with the syndicate, and then I couldn't fight them, Ellen. Can you do it, Phil? Can you murder a man? No. Not even a murderer like Joe Ainsley. Ellen, think back. What was that telephone number Ainsley dialed when we first came into that office? I think it was 792415. I'll try and see who answers. 79. We could play wrong number and see if we can't get the address. Hello? Uh, hello. Who is this, please? Judge Great. Who are you? Uh, sorry, wrong number. Who was it? Judge Gregg. Jonathan Gray? The same. Well, then I'm wrong. Judge Gregg hates the party even more than I do. Joe Ainsley wouldn't be telling Judge Gregg to do something or else. Or would he? Wait a minute, Ron. The perjury trial of several party members comes up this week with Judge Gregg presiding. Yeah, like this. They'll threaten him unless he disqualifies himself. That would account for Ainsley's threats over the phone. With Judge Gregg on the bench, there'll be no leniency. With him disqualified, they might have his successor under control. Surely they haven't penetrated that high. Remember the atom bomb, Ellen. Come well, on, let's drive out and have a chat with Judge Gregg. I'm sorry, but... Oh, hello, Phil. Hello, Judge Gregg. Uh, you know Ellen Norris. Yes, of course. Glad to see you both. Come in. We'd love to. Thank you. Well... What can I do for you, Phil? Judge, I received confidential reports that pressure is being brought to bear on you to disqualify yourself from hearing the perjury case against various party members. Phil, I won't ask where you heard this, but I can assure you that it's not true. No pressure has been brought to bear to have me disqualify myself. Does that satisfy you? Yes. Yes, of course. I, I know you hate them as much as I do. Your speeches against them should be in every school and club in America. Thank you, Phil. Now uh, we'll be going. But if ever I can help, just let me know. Thank you, I will. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Norris. Goodbye, Judge Gray. Phil, so, that telephone number still sticks in my brain. My too, Ellen, but we must have been mistaken. Unless Judge Gregg is carrying the threats on his own broad shoulders. Watch it. Don't run that stop light. I'm going to pull up at this drugstore. I want to call the syndicate. This doesn't make sense. Maybe I can get some information from them. Central City. 
this central city. Ainsley me in hiding since murder of Pollock. Have been unable to locate him. Find Judge Gregg. Ainsley will make an attempt on his life. You will kill Ainsley first. What did you find out? I think I see why the syndicate wants Ainsley removed. I'm glad you do, for I certainly can't see any connection. That dummy office is a propaganda headquarters, Ellen. It takes money to distribute propaganda. My guess is that the party, led by Joe Ainsley, is trying to muscle in on the syndicate's racket. That makes sense. Judge Gregg? I wanted to protect him. The syndicate wants Ainsley killed and the other members convicted. Judge Gregg will give them maximum sentences and the syndicate gets rid of the competition. Are we going back to Burger King? Yes. I intend to eat, drink, and sleep with Judge Gregg until Ainsley makes his play. Then I'll arrest Ainsley if possible. If not, I'll do whatever is necessary. Just remember, we can send him to the chair. He won't be playing for fun. Oh, but too late. Judge Gregg's car is in his garage. It was here when we left, but now it isn't. Which could mean... Joe Ainsley's already got him. The logical place is Adolphus Street, 324 Traff Building. This time, the oak door is neither locked nor arrogant. The axes of the fireman had seen to that. I ease open the door, but it's a waste of precaution. The room is empty, except for Judge Gregg, tied to a chair, his hands down on his lap and a gag in his mouth. As I reach down to untie his hands, he makes a very unwelcome noise. His eyes plead with me. He shakes his head from side to side. I whirl, but no one is behind me. Again, I reach for the ropes around his hands. Then I get it. A thin piece of piano wire interwoven with a knot and running down to a box on the floor. I remember Joe Ainsley has been in the Corps of Engineers, and I get the picture. Judge Gregg is booby-trapped. One tug at the ropes, I jiggle the wire, and the bomb in the box gives us a one-way passage to Kingdom Come. Too bad, Phil. If you pulled the trigger, it would have saved us a lot of trouble. Who's out of door, Conrad? Conrad? How do you spell it? Shall I belt it? No. Well, let me come over here beside Judge Gregg. You too, Phil. The uh, honorable Judge Gregg, I should add. Party technique to sneer at honor and respectability. You never outgrew your Boy Scout training. You should have had Boy Scout training, Joe. What happened to you? I progressed beyond horse and buggy ideologies. The horse I'll pass. Buggy, no. You had a good war record. You mean because I know how to rig a booby trap? Look, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, and I haven't time for Sunday school lectures. The booby trap fruit. What now? We'll still use it. Only better. Uh, get that extra rope. We tie all their hands and wrists together, shorten the wire trigger to the bomb, and leave them bending over. Sooner or later, one of them will straighten up, or the other one will faint, and... Uh, boom! By that time, we're miles away with an airtight alibi. That's genius. You can't get away with this. The hit's preposterous. You two are the only witnesses who saw me kill Pollock. You're the only two who can connect me with the party. I kept my affiliation a secret, and I had no intention of having you spoil it. There, Judge. With that gag out of your mouth, you can say a few hundred well chosen words about the evils of the party. I hear it, Ellen. Look, Joe, don't do it. You can plead self defense for shooting Pollock. You can resign from the party. Judge Gregg has disqualified himself. You've accomplished what you want to do. Phil, secretly, I've always thought you were a fool. A square headed, flag waving, patriotic, all American fool. Tell him, Judge. Well, I'm Phil. Greg has to die because he did disqualify himself. We wanted him to hear the case. You see, Judge Greg has been a member of the party since 1933. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I don't believe it. It's true, heaven help me. And from that day till this, I've known no peace and no way to break away from them. You were supposed to hear their case and be lenient. Yes, that's it. But I couldn't go through with it. Well, Joe, you said you'd kill me if I disqualified myself. At least I'll go an American. Not 100%, but still an American. You know, anyone who does what I did must be insane. You should be put in a padded cell. Yes, a padded cell. Judge Gregg repeats the padded cell. I find the tumble. Steel walls and thick padding might save us from the bomb blast. I'm going to stand between me and the cell door. Ainsley's kneeling beside Judge Gregg, looping the wire around the second rope, which will be used to tie our wrists. We'll be finished in just a second, and it'll be too late. Judge Gregg sees our got it. He moves over and bumps his head against Joe Ainsley's as Conrad looks into the commotion. I dive against Ellen, driving us into the padded room. A second later, the universe caves in on me. I come 
to you, the cutest little brown-eyed angel in the world, holding a cool hand on my brow. As the harps and choir receive the angel on books or wings and a down. Dr. Lee says no talking. Oh, what? What happened? Confession for you. And the others? Their troubles are over. Alan, I, I can't get over Judge Greg. Do you? Shh. Neither can I. Enjoy, Ainsley. These two men had mentalities approaching genius. How could supposedly brilliant men fall for the party line? Well, they're very clever in their recruiting. They probe until they find your weakness and then play up to it. Another thing, they're selling an intangible product. If their prospective members could actually see the living conditions of the countries where the party is in power, the party could count as new members on one hand. That's true. And if things are so wonderful over there, why do women in New York leap from windows? And others in Canada risk death for entire families rather than be sent back. It's no crime now to become a party member. Perhaps it's no mark of ignorance to work in the party, but how any intelligent man can stay a member is beyond me. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands there are in this country, sir, but I hope that when we have to make their choice, there'll be more Judge Greggs than Joe Ainsley. A word of advice, Ellen. Never join any organization until you've read its bylaws and know who founded it and why. And a word of advice to you. Phone the syndicate and then back to keep. But, Ellen. Now. Mm. Your lips, as we used to say in high school, S W A K. Sealed with a kiss. But. Oh, Phil, you got to seal. Now I'll have to do it all over. Mm. Oh, this could go on indefinitely. My idea, exactly. <laughs> Starring Carlton Young is based upon characters created by Stetson Humphrey, and any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Betty Moran plays Ellen. Others in the cast were Julius Kraubein, Larry Hobkin, Lee Millar, Byron Kane, Gil Stratton, and George Peroni. Today, The Whisperer was written, produced, and directed by Bill Kahn. Music by Johnny Duffy. This is Don Rickles inviting you to join us again next week for another exciting adventure, another fight against crime by... Today, the National Broadcasting Company welcomes four radio stations to their ever-growing list of affiliates. Congratulations, then, to these four stations. WSCR, Scranton, Pennsylvania. WBML, Macon, Georgia. WJIM, Lansing, Michigan. And WGFG, Kalamazoo, Michigan.